Welcome to The Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Flummer. This episode is the first in a three-part series on libertarian views of free will. Libertarians believe that we have free will and that free will is incompatible with causal determinism. The first type of libertarianism that we will cover is event causal libertarianism. Our guest today is Chris Franklin, and as always, you can submit questions to us via our website, thefreewillshow.com, or via social media, at The Free Will Show. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to introduce Chris Franklin, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Humanities at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Chris received his PhD in philosophy from the University of California, Riverside in 2010, and he's published several articles on free will and moral responsibility. He's also written a book titled A Minimal Libertarianism. Free Will and the Promise of Reduction, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. So welcome to the show, Chris. Uh, could you start by telling us a bit about yourself, your work, and how you came to be interested in working on free will? Well, thanks, Taylor and Matt, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Um, I found myself uh, getting interested in free will towards the end of my sophomore year of college. I was a theology studies major and I went to a college that required everyone to take a philosophy class. So there I was taking my required philosophy class, no idea what I was in for. And it was pretty much for me love uh, at first sight. Hmm. I think both in terms of just the subject matter, um, they were the kinds of questions, I guess it felt like I had always been interested in these, but I didn't know it. Um, and so just the conversations, the issues broached were really fascinating to me. I was always, I was also really taken with the intellectual virtues of the professor. I was taken by the way in which he just treated every question very, very seriously. Indeed, it seemed like the harder the question was, the more joy he took in the question. And there was just a real kind of seriousness and carefulness and thoughtfulness that was really wonderful to me. So I left that class, declared a philosophy major, and um, found myself taking a free will class. Uh, and this was really fascinating to me for a couple of reasons, one of which was that when I was an undergraduate, I held a position, a theological position known as Calvinism. Now, that's a complex position we don't need to go into, but for our listeners, the salient point of that position is this. Uh, it has the view that God determines everything, at least one version of it. That is that everything that happens is the inevitable result of God's eternal decrees. And a natural question within that view is, well, where in the world is freedom or moral responsibility? And I think I had always just kind of thought, it's a mystery. Um, I don't know how to work that out. And I find myself taking this upper division class on free will. And here are all these very, very interesting philosophers who aren't by any stretch of the imagination Calvinists defending a kind of view of free will in which you can be free and yet determined by factors outside of your control. So it seemed to me that doing some philosophical work might really enhance the defensibility of my Calvinism. And so that was what kind of got me interested um, in um, free will. And I went on to the University of California, Riverside, to study with uh, John Martin Fisher, who's a very famous defender of a kind of um, compatibilist. I suppose part of the irony of this is that in my second year, I changed my mind uh, and gave up <laughs> compatibilism uh, and accepted libertarianism. I always joke with the professor who who taught the class in which this conversion took place. His name's Gary Watson, also a very famous compatibilist. And the class was on Thomas Reed, who's a famous um, 18th century um, Scottish philosopher and who has a wonderful book called The Essays on the Active Powers of Man. And I just found myself very, very taken with the kind of argument. So I always joke with Gary that it's his fault that I became uh, a libertarian. <laughs> nice. Yeah, excellent. Well, you've already mentioned this word libertarianism. Uh, normally it's, it's claimed that it's a conjunction of two different claims like incompatibilism and that we sometimes act freely. Can you explain how, how you use these terms, what you take them to be? Yeah, good question. So yeah, you know, libertarianism is usually defined as making two claims. Um, one is that, uh, free will is incompatible with determinism. And the second is that we do sometimes act freely. So let's take the first claim first. So when it comes to this claim of incompatibilism, that is free will is incompatible with determinism, it can be a slightly, slightly slippery claim insofar as there's different kinds of determinism. So I've already mentioned a kind of theological determinism, 
typically when philosophers think about determinism, though, they think about what's often called physical determinism. The thought is something like, according to physical determinism, everything that occurs, if determinism is true, everything that occurs is the inevitable result of the past and laws of nature. So if determinism attains in our world, then our talking here right now was inevitable billions of years ago, given the initial conditions of our universe and the laws of nature, right? So the thought is everything's inevitable um, uh, because of those uh, events. Um, so for many people, this seems to be incompatible with free will. So libertarians are among those, and they think, look, uh, free will is not compatible with determinism. And typically when I'm writing about this, I'm thinking about physical determinism, though I'm, I, I pretty much think free will is compatible with all kinds of determinism. So we'll probably focus on physical determinism. When it comes to the issue of acting freely, that I think perhaps is even a little bit more complex. And I think the term can be used differently. And people have different kinds of things in mind when they think about the idea of freedom. When I think about freedom, I think of freedom uh, in this, in, in the sense of free will, as something like the strongest control condition necessary for moral responsibility. So let me unpack that, right? So again, the thought is, and a free action is an action such that it satisfies the strongest control condition for moral responsibility. So it seems to me, in thinking about freedom, we've got to think about this thing, moral responsibility. Now, I'll just go ahead and say something controversial. There's a wonderful literature about what moral responsibility is, and it's rich and worth thinking about. The kind of moral responsibility I'm interested in is often called moral accountability. And the thought here is something like, when you're morally accountable for an action, then you deserve praise for that action if, say, the action goes beyond what could reasonably be expected of you, or you deserve blame if the action's morally wrong. So if I'm morally accountable for, say, giving to charity, then in that case, I deserve praise. Or say, if I'm morally accountable for breaking my promise, in that case, I deserve blame. And the sense of desert here is important, right? Sometimes we blame and praise people for forward-looking considerations, right? So when I praise my two-year-old for putting away her crayons, my thought isn't something like she deeply merits this praise, right? The thought is something like, yeah. maybe if I praise her, she'll actually do this again. Um, so sometimes we praise people. Sometimes we also blame them when she doesn't pick up her crayons, not because in some sense they deserve it, but simply because we're trying to cultivate a certain kind of character. But the idea is when you're morally accountable, you deserve praise or you deserve blame. There's just a sense in which it's a fitting response to what you've done. So that's the sense of moral responsibility I'm interested in. And since the time of Aristotle, people have distinguished two kind of broad conditions of what's required to be morally accountable. The thought is you've got to satisfy certain epistemic or cognitive conditions, right? To be morally accountable, you have to have an understanding of, at least to some degree, of the nature of right and wrong, what you're doing, and so on and so forth. But there's also a control condition. The action, in some sense, has to be up to you. So as I see it, acting freely is performing an action such that it satisfies the control condition required for being morally responsible, right? So the thought is something like if you put those together, libertarians contend that um, the kind of freedom required for being morally responsible is incompatible with determinism, and yet we sometimes do act freely. Thanks. That's awesome. So I wanted to ask a question about the incompatibilist component of your libertarianism. So in the first season of the free will show, we talked about the consequence argument, and we also talked about the manipulation argument, both of which are aimed at establishing a kind of incompatibilism. So do you take either of these arguments to be successful? Or is there maybe some other reason that you think free will is incompatible with determinism? Yeah, great question. So I suppose to some degree, it depends what you mean by successful. And it also depends what you mean by these arguments. So <laughs> if by successful, you mean something like, um, are there versions of these arguments that are sound? That is, are there versions of these arguments that are logically valid? The premises really do support the conclusion and the premises are true. I think, yes, there certainly are versions of either the manipulation argument or the consequence argument 
um, that are sound. I also think, and this is somewhat more controversial, that there are versions of these arguments that make it reasonable for one to believe that they have sufficient evidentiary force for people to actually accept incompatible. The reason I say this is mm. because, you know, we always tend to find the arguments that support our own position persuasive. Um, and there's yeah. various kinds of arguments people know of that might be sound, but really aren't right uh, uh, persuasive at all. And one constant kind of discussion is kind of, as a kind of meta philosophical discussion is kind of what constitutes conditions of success. Some of the people you've actually interviewed, people like Alfred Neely and Peter Vanewagen, have done some interesting work on thinking about kind of what constitutes success in a philosophical argument. But it seems to me, not, no, I just want to be careful. I'm not saying that these arguments are such that any reasonable person would be an incompatibilist. I just think they're such that it makes it reasonable for someone who, say, hadn't made up their mind yet, or say someone who was a compatibilist, to say, you know what, these are strong enough that I'm going to go ahead and accept incompatibilism. So in that sense, I do think um, some of them are successful. Now, I've already kind of noted that there are versions of these. So with the manipulation argument, um, perhaps kind of two very prominent contemporary families of this argument come in something that's often called the zygote argument uh, or original case argument. Uh, Alfred Miele is a very important defender of this kind of argument. Um, there's also something known as the four case kind of manipulation argument. All these arguments try to get at this idea that it seems like um, uh, determinism is incompatible uh, with um, freedom because if it were compatible with it, then freedom would be compatible with very severe kinds of manipulation. And since it's just pretty obvious that free will isn't compatible with those forms of manipulation, so also it's not compatible. So that's roughly how those arguments work. But there's also something called the consequence argument. And this, I think, becomes really tricky to say, well, what is that argument? Um, so Peter Van Wagen writes a wonderful book in 1983 called An Essay on Free Will. And in that book, he gives a kind of initial description of the consequence argument. It's something like this. Uh, if determinism is true, then my actions are the consequence of the past and laws. But it's not up to me what the past and laws are, so my actions aren't up to me. And it gets called the consequence argument. There's a thought of something like, if determinism is true, then my actions are the consequences of the past and laws of nature. But look, you can't now change what happened in the past, and you can never change the laws of nature. And since your actions are the inevitable consequences of these things, and they're beyond your control, your actions are beyond your control. Because something like this description of the consequence argument and then somewhat notoriously, he says, I'll now give three versions of the consequence argument. And I don't know what his kind of principle of individuation is for arguments, but it's very hard to see how the arguments are the same arguments. And there's a very rich literature on all of these different arguments. A lot of, a lot of times people focus on what's called the third argument from him, and they all get kind of grouped together as the consequence argument. So what exactly the consequence argument is hard to say, but in my book, I give something that I very much think is of a kind of consequence argument. I call it the no opportunity argument, but it very much is working with Van Wagen's kind of key idea that if our actions are the result of the past and laws, and since it's not up to us what the past and laws are, our actions in a important sense are up to us. So I think kind of properly worked out a version of that argument is sound. Oh, thanks. That was very clear. So uh, you mentioned the argument from your book. And in your book, you also defend, or the, the main topic is defending a, a view called event causal libertarianism. So what does event causal mean? And why would you hold a view of that kind? Yeah, yeah. So I think this is actually one of the harder things to grasp um, uh, in uh, the literature. So I'll do my best and you guys point out things that seem unclear. But Let's first, yeah, focus on event causal. So um, what do we mean by event causal? Well, the event causalist makes two claims. Oh, in fact, actually, sorry, let me just also note, event causal can be an, an adjective applied to different views. You could be an event causal compatibilist. Um, so event causal is detachable from libertarianism. So mm -hmm. let me first maybe just say a little bit about event causal and then maybe a little bit about event causal libertarianism and then why defend a view. So first, event causal. So the event causalist is committed to two claims. First, she thinks free actions are actions that are caused. So there are some folks who are non-causalists and they actually contend that free will 
or an exercise of free will need not or perhaps even cannot be caused at all. Um, most people don't hold this view, but there are some people who do. So the event causalist already makes a controversial claim that look, exercises of free will are causal in nature. So when an agent performs a free decision, she causes that decision. Okay, so that's the first claim. Now we can think about the second claim, and we can think about the second claim by asking a question. What is it for the agent to cause her decision? What is that consistent? And here's what the event causal says. The event causal says it, can, it consists in uh, mental events and states that involve the agent causing the decision in the proper way. So the thought is something like, when I decide to order a BLT for lunch, that decision is caused by my, say, desire uh, to eat a BLT and my belief that I can contribute to that event's occurring uh, by ordering a BLT. So the thought is what it is for me to cause something are for certain, not any old state and event of me, but certain states, say my reasons or beliefs or desires, and there's some controversial on which, but perhaps we don't need to go into that. But the thought is something like what it is for the agent to bring about her action or for events and states involving her bringing about that action. And that's the name event causal. The thought here is let's be careful. It's not that the agent doesn't cause her action. Oh yeah, the agent does cause her action, but what that means, what, what that consists in is for events and states of the agent to bring about that action. So that's what uh, the event causal uh, view is. Now, why um, why defend such a view? Um, I suppose we could think about kind of general reasons people might have for defending it. We could also think about my reasons for defending it. I think one very general reason people defend this view is a kind of principle of parsimony. So you, we might just say something like, look, it's obvious that there are such things as desires, beliefs, reasons, um, and so if we're trying to understand how agency works, why not appeal to the things that are kind of obviously before us? Now, for those who aren't familiar with this debate, that's because sometimes people appeal to certain kinds of things that are claimed to be very unusual. Um, and so the thought here is a nice thing about the event causal is, look, it's just appealing to psychological states. Those seem about as good as anything to assume that they exist. And so we know there are desires and beliefs. We know desires and beliefs cause things. So if we can account for free will in terms of these, then that's a rather parsimonious or simple view. You know, we don't want to just go positing a bunch of things for no good reasons. If we can account for free will in terms of events and states, that seems like the better way to go. So I think that's a very common reason. One reason I find particularly compelling is that it seems to me just experientially that our motives cause uh, when I think about being under the sway of desire or even under the sway of a powerful reason, it seems like we want to describe these motives like this. They pulled me to make this decision or they pushed me to make this decision. That is, our experience of motives seemed to be causal in nature. And I think a very uh, attractive thing about the event causal view is it gives a very straightforward account of how motivation is brought into the world of free will. How, how do motives interact with their exercises of free will? The answer is very simple. They cause them. Um, so I think that's a very attractive view. And when you have other views, I think have a bit more difficulty explaining how motivation gets hooked up with, as it were, um, uh, an exercise of uh, free will. Thanks. I think we'll ask you some other questions related to what you were just saying in a minute. But one thing we also wanted to ask here was about the ability to do otherwise. So a common thread throughout a lot of the first season of our show was about how some people think of free will as involving leeway or the freedom to do otherwise than what one does. We even talked about Frankfurt cases calling into question this idea that um, in order to be morally responsible, you have to have been able to do otherwise. Um, I take it you agree that there's some kind of ability to do otherwise requirement for free will, but you also think uh, there's a distinction between ability and opportunity, and you think it's really important that we talk about opportunities as well. So could you tell us a little bit about why you think we should talk about opportunities as well as abilities? Yeah, good question. Um, I think that in the free will debate, there can be... Uh, 
various places where there's tendencies to talk past one another. Um, and I think ability is a central place because the term ability in related terms, opportunity, or just say the verb can, um, are ambiguous or perhaps a, perhaps context sensitive in ways that make them kind of tricky. So just put a really simple case before our minds, right? Imagine um, a, a world class golfer uh, who, uh, to in order to keep him out of the upcoming match, has been tied tightly to his desk chair. And we imagine someone asking, can he sink a putt? Can he sink a putt? You could imagine people having different reactions to this question. You could imagine say, someone saying, obviously, this person can sink a putt. Um, he's a world-class golfer, after all. Uh, he, he doesn't have any kind of injuries in his arms or legs. He's got the various kinds of sensory motor capacities are perfectly in place. He absolutely can sink a putt. You might imagine someone saying, of course he can't sink a putt. He's tied to a chair. Um, now, what I want to claim about this situation is there's there need not be any disagreement here. Um, rather, what's going on is that the term can can be used to pick out different kinds of capacity or modal terms or opportunities an agent has. So in the first case, when someone wants to insist that even while tied to the chair, the person can sink their putt, they're focusing on something like the intrinsic features of the agent, kind of what goes up into the agent. And, and, and an agent has these kinds of abilities, whether or not they're sitting in a chair, whether they're on a plane, whether they're asleep. You know, when I go to sleep, I don't, I don't, I don't lose the ability in some sense to walk, right? When I wake up, I don't have to relearn this. I, 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 I can do it. I retain this ability even while asleep. Um, I, I retain this ability even right in all kinds of different situations. Um, and, but nonetheless, there's another sense of can where it seems like there's a very straightforward sense in which the golfer can't sink a putt. And it's that the ropes in some way deprive him of the opportunity to exercise those abilities. So we could go more into this, but I think it's the first important to realize terms like can, terms like ability, I think in our normal uh, everyday discourse be used to pick out different features and thus sometimes there can seem to be disagreements in which there aren't necessarily disagreements. And so a key part, for example, of my kind of overall defense of libertarianism, it's really a kind of two-stage defense. First, we've got to get clear on what we mean by moral accountability. And then we have to ask ourselves what kinds of modal features, abilities, opportunities, whatever we want to call them, must be true of an agent for her to be a morally accountable agent. And what I want to say is there's kind of two broad categories here. There's what I call abilities and what I call opportunities. And abilities roughly track the kind of thing the first person is trying to pick out. These kinds of intrinsic features of the agent that are with you pretty much regardless of your situation or your environment. And I use opportunity to pick out this second uh, kind of thing that the person is trying to pick out, namely uh, a kind of capacity or opportunity that does depend on what situation, right? So uh, ropes, uh, airplanes being asleep can deprive one of the opportunity, right? Um, I suppose maybe there are some golfers who could sink a uh, putt even in their sleep, but right, most wouldn't be able to do that. So things <laughs> like being asleep or being in a locked uh, room or being tied down would remove uh, the opportunity to do otherwise. And so it seems to me that in order for an agent to be morally accountable, it's not enough just to have ability in the sense of intrinsic capacity, but she also needs to be in an environment that, as it were, is cooperating, that gives her the opportunity to exercise um, those kinds of, of abilities. And I think this, this is certainly not something I am by any stretch of the means uh, the first person to point out. This is something I think people have appreciated. And I've tried to use my hope is that ability and opportunity are kind of moderately intuitive ways to kind of pick out um, this difference. But I think it's a difference that's very key to keep in mind if we're able, if we're going to understand the sense in which, say, determinism is a threat uh, to free will. For, because it doesn't seem to me like determinism is a threat to our ability in this sense in which I'd retain the ability even while tied to a chair. Rather, it seems to me that determinism, if it's a threat at all, it's going to be a threat to something like our opportunity to exercise 
um, those abilities. So for me, getting clear in that distinction is crucial if we're going to clearly see the threat um, of determinism to free will. My key claim is that determinism is a threat not to the ability to do otherwise, but rather the opportunity to do otherwise. You mentioned this distinction is old, and it goes back at least as far as John Locke, right? So he's got this famous man in the locked room example. Is this tracking something similar? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and it's certainly older than that, right? So if you take someone like Anselm, um, Anselm was very careful to distinguish many different senses of can um, and ability. But the John Locke one is, is another kind of example in which people want to recognize, look, Abilities come in, again, different varieties or, or different kinds of senses. Uh, and um, one thing we need to get clarity on is what sense of it matters. And that, I think, is a hard question. And then you ask, well, what do you care about? And again, my way of trying to understand that is what we care about is moral accountability. It's not the only thing we care about. But that's the thing I care about. And so I'm trying to understand what's the sense of ability relevant to moral accountability, whereas if you take someone like Locke, um, he is certainly interested in that sense, but he's also interested in things like voluntariness, right? So we might be wondering mm-hmm. about all different senses of freedom, and these can come apart in different ways. I'm sure some of this came up in your discussions about Frankfurt-style cases. So when you come at this debate and you think about things like freedom or responsibility, and then you start to ask questions like, are these compatible with determinism or indeterminism? It seems to me the first question is, well, what do you mean by moral responsibility? And we've got to begin to start to make sense of that. And then once we start to make sense of that, we can start to go through the various senses of can and ask, do you need this sense, right? Or do you need this sense? And so on and so forth, where sometimes it seems to me the discussion, the contemporary literature starts in the middle. Um, and it seems to me that if it's a compatibilist defending compatibilism, the incompatibilist won't be very convinced, or if it's an incompatibilist defending incompatibilism, the compatibilist won't be very convinced because there's some kind of more fundamental disagreement going on. Yeah. Well, you call your view of minimal libertarianism in your book. What, what do you mean by minimal in this? Yeah, good question. So, um, libertarianism, uh, comes for most uh, contemporary theorists with some baggage. Um, that is, it's the kind of view that when I tell people I defend, a common reaction is, really? <laughs> um, uh, so part of the reason for that baggage is a perception that libertarianism is metaphysically extravagant. That is, that libertarianism to really make sense of free will as the libertarian conceives of it would require us to posit agents with uh, potentially kind of quasi supernatural um, powers. Somewhat famously and perhaps somewhat unfortunately, a wonderful philosopher, Roderick Chisholm, talked about humans satisfying libertarianism as having a kind of power that some only thought that God would have, namely being unmoved movers. Now, he didn't meet that as a criticism. <laughs> But a lot of critics of libertarianism saw a kind of joke in that comment. They thought, exactly, you have to be Mm. God (laughs) to have free will on this kind of view. (laughs) Um, Now, I don't think that's quite being fair to Chisholm. um, But nonetheless, that is a persistent perception of libertarianism. So a key thing I wanted to try to do uh, in this book was to show that you could defend libertarianism in a rather minimalist way, where minimalist, again, here has to do something like without taking on very many metaphysical commitments. Indeed, more carefully, the thesis of the book is give me the best compatibilist account of free will you got, and all I need to add to it is the presence of indeterminism in the right place, and we've got an account of free will. That is, we've got a, a viable account of libertarianism. Um, so the, the minimal, somewhat the comparative claim, the thought is kind of when you compare libertarianism to compatibilism, it actually turns out that there's a defensible version of libertarianism that differs from compatibilism only in requiring the presence of indeterminism. Thanks. Um, one other proponent of event causal libertarianism in recent years is Robert Kane, um, but your view differs from his quite a bit. So could you explain uh, the main differences between Robert Kane's view and yours? Yeah. Uh, so so Kane's work is really um, important in this area. And for those of us who are or are attracted to event causal libertarianism, his, his work is absolutely 
um, foundational. I sometimes want to say that because us philosophers are often far more interested in differences uh, than similarities. And that's good, I think, in some kinds of ways. But here, I want to just point out there are numerous ways in which my count is deeply uh, indebted uh, to Keynes' work. And indeed, as kind of someone who's profited from Keynes' work, I would say, you know, the kind of mistakes he made that I think at least he made are the kind of mistakes that any person trying to kind of develop a rather new view tend to make. So I think kind of the broad contours of his view are, are right. There are just certain kinds of mistakes in the details and nonetheless, though, important mistakes that end up leading his view, I think, into some problems. So I suppose the best way to get your, get your mind into Keynes' view is something like this. Many people claim, have claimed, we'll probably talk about this in a few minutes, that indeterminism, not, not determinism, but indeterminism is incompatible with free will. That is, if your action was really undetermined, uh, it wouldn't be up to you. And so Cain, drawing from some other thinkers, offers some cases to refute this. So he gives a famous case of a husband who slams his fist down on a glass uh, coffee table uh, in, a, in a fit of anger with a disagreement with his wife. And he says, imagine that there's some kind of indeterministic process at work such that it's undetermined whether or not the fist hitting the glass table will break it or not. Um, nonetheless, given that the husband was trying to break the glass coffee table, and I suppose it should be added that this is his wife's favorite piece of furniture, um, it seems that he's to blame for breaking it, even though it was undetermined. Or we can imagine a case in which an assassin takes aim and fires and kills a prime minister. It seems like he's to blame, even though we can imagine there's an indeterminate process of the gun such that the gun might not have fired despite his point of view. And again, in both these cases, what's the key idea? The key idea is, well, in both cases, the person was trying to perform the action. And thus, even though it was undetermined, it seems like the agent is responsible and perhaps even free in performing that action. And so Cain's idea is something like, well, how can we understand then free decisions? Well, perhaps free decisions are decisions that are undetermined, but nonetheless are things you're trying to do. So a key feature of Cain's account of free will is that in the cases of um, free action, or at least free actions that don't come to arrive or come from any earlier actions, um, they're brought about by some kind of effort to perform that action. Now, this gets increasingly complicated as Cain defends his view. He adds, he eventually adds in what he calls dual trines. Perhaps we'll leave those out and just keep it for a very kind of simplistic view just to see the contrast with my view. So for Cain's view, every time you perform a, a basically free action, you were trying to perform that action. Now, what I want to say in the minimal libertarianism view is we need not make that requirement, right? So on, so on my view, what brings about your free decisions need not be trines, but simply your reasons for performing that action. And part of the reason for seeing this is it feels like Cain is kind of punting when it comes to the main issue. So go back to the assassin case. Why do we all have the intuition that he's responsible for killing the prime minister? Well, it seems like we have that intuition because he was responsible for trying to kill the prime minister. Again, if you modify the case and imagine he has no responsibility for trying to kill the prime minister, then it's not going to be very plausible to think he's responsible for killing the prime minister. So in these cases that Cain uses, our intuition is really being driven that the action is free because the earlier trying is free. Well, now we have to go back to this trying then and ask, well, what is it for your trying to be free? It's not going to be very plausible to posit another trying, right? That's just going to, again, postpone the issue. So one worry about Keynes' account is that by bringing in these efforts of will, we're really not solving or really not even addressing the kind of fundamental problem. And, it's, and the fundamental problem is something like whenever your activity begins, whether it begins in a decision or it begins with an effort of will, how does that get free? How does that become something free? And, and on my view, I just start with decisions without positing any earlier efforts of will and try to kind of, as it were, take the problem by the horns. And I think also, though, avoid some of the kind of oddities of Cain's view in that respect. Yeah. Well, libertarians face 
some problems that I think a lot of people agree about. Um, and we could group these into two main problems. Uh, the problem of luck, we, we had an episode on last season, and the problem of enhanced control. Could you explain what you take each of these problems to be and how your view addresses them? Yeah, so the way I think of the problem of luck is as follows. Um, the proponent of the problem of luck, that is the person who thinks the problem of luck really is a problem for libertarians, will usually say something like this. Look, you libertarians think an action is free only if it's undetermined. That is, you libertarians think that a necessary condition for the presence of free will is indeterminism. But actually, so claim the proponents of the problem of luck, the uh, presence of indeterminism is sufficient for the absence of free will. That is, indeterminism itself precludes free will. So here the thought is, according to the problem of luck, that indeterminism so far from securing free will or contributing to free will or enhancing control actually precludes the kind of control required for agents to act freely. Um, you, you could imagine now, turning to the problem of enhanced control, someone being a bit more conciliatory. You can imagine them saying something like, well, okay, maybe indeterminism doesn't really preclude control or diminish control or eliminate control, but there's nothing about indeterminism that increases control. There's nothing about indeterminism that enhances an agent's control, right? A rock that indeterministically falls down a mountain doesn't exercise any more control uh, because it was indeterministic. Um, and so the problem of luck, right, very, very simply, is something like the presence of indeterminism diminishes control, is inimical to control, whereas the problem of enhanced control says something like there's nothing about indeterminism that increases control. Now, if the problem of enhanced control sounds a bit funny, you have to appreciate the dialectical space in which this problem is raised. Right? What, what compatibilists today, maybe just to get a sense of the territory, I think uh, my reading of the literature is there's very few compatibilists today who think the problem of luck is actually successful. Uh, there are some compatibilists who kind of as we press the problem of luck as a friendly challenge, but most of them don't actually think the problem of luck uh, is successful. And part of the reason for that is a lot of compatibilists want to be what Manuel Vargas calls super compatibilists. That is, there are compatibilists about free will and determinism and compatibilists about free will and indeterminism. If you find someone who really is pressing the problem of luck, that is, they think it's actually successful, Chances are they're a free will nihilist, and this is just one part of their two-part attack on free will. Most compatibles, I think, have these days moved to something like the problem of enhanced control. They say, okay, yeah, sure, you could be free, and yet you're actually undetermined. But the libertarians, by positing indeterminism, do not secure any more control than the compatibilist account. So indeterminism is just superfluous. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not, doesn't matter. So that's how I kind of read the two problems and the kind of dialectical space in which people um, uh, press those problems. I suppose it's a little easier to see how my account tries to address the problem of enhanced control. So the way I develop this in the book is as follows. So um, I begin by trying to understand what it is for an agent to be morally accountable. And I understand an agent to be morally accountable just in case the agent had free will with respect to her action. And free will, I argue, consists in having the opportunity to exercise the powers of reflective self-control in a variety of ways. So what are the powers of reflective self-control? Well, those are powers to evaluate the various courses of action before you, to come to an assessment about say, what's the best action, to make a decision right about what to do in light of that assessment, and so on and so forth. And I contend that for an agent be free and morally accountable. She's got to possess those abilities, but she also needs the opportunity to exercise those capacities in various ways, particularly more than the way she actually does. But if determinism is true, then she can only exercise those capacities in the way that she actually does. She lacks the opportunity to exercise the capacity in any other way. So how does indeterminism enhance control? Well, by furnishing agents within determinism, we furnish them with the opportunity to exercise 
their abilities of reflective self-control in more than one way. It's important here to see I'm not claiming that indeterminism is intrinsically or in and of itself control enhancing, right? So again, if you if a rock's falling down a mountain is indeterministic, that neither enhances its control nor diminishes the control because rocks have no control, right? So my thought is indeterminism is relevant to enhancing control when placed in the right kinds of things, namely agents that possess the powers of reflective self-control. But I also don't think locating indeterminism in any old place increases control. It seems to me, so suppose, I, suppose I try to raise my hand. And suppose my trying to raise my hand leaves it undetermined whether my hand goes up. That doesn't really seem to enhance my control. If anything, you might think it diminishes it better if my tryings always succeed. Indeed, for those of us who work at sports, that's kind of what we're working towards. Mm -hmm. uh, right? We're trying to increase the frequency in which our tries are successful. So indeterminism doesn't enhance the control in any old thing. It's got to be the right kind of thing, namely an agent with the powers of reflective self-control. Also, I think the indeterminism needs to be located at the right point, namely the point of making the decision or making the trying uh, in the first place. So, of course, all those people might push back on all those, but that's kind of roughly how I think about indeterminism enhancing control. It's a bit harder to say about how my account deals with the problem of luck. And the reason for this is I think the problem of luck comes in many, many varieties. And while I wish there was one kind of smooth move by which I could dismantle all these versions. Uh, I've yet to find it. If any of my listeners know of one, please email me. Um, but uh, here the thought is something like um, to try to show that the most worrisome versions of the problem of luck make false assumptions about libertarianism. And those versions of the problem of luck that don't make false assumptions about libertarianism aren't really worrisome. So maybe I'll just give a sample of each of those, but again, there's much more to be said. So for example, Hume and Hobbes, uh, famous proponents of the problem of luck, assumed that causation was a form of necessitation. That is, they assumed whenever there's a cause, the cause necessitates uh, the effect. And since if the effect is undetermined, it's not necessitated, then that means the effect isn't caused. And so they claim that if an action is undetermined, not only is it not caused by the past and laws, that might sound nice, it's not caused by anything, not even the agent. And now that doesn't seem so good. Um, so if it really is the case that undetermined actions are uncaused actions, then it looks like undetermined actions are just matters of luck, random occurrences. But of course, today, most libertarians deny the premise that causation is a form of necessitation. They contend that there can be genuinely indeterministic causes. So that problem makes a false, or excuse me, that, yeah, that version of the problem makes a false assumption about libertarianism. There is another famous version of the problem of luck that, that runs something like in terms of the lack of explanation. The thought is something like, look, if it was really undetermined uh, whether or not I kept my promise and broke my promise, then right prior to my deciding to keep my promise, everything that passed me holding fix, I could have gone some other way. Holding fix my motives, holding fix my desires. It could have been that the outcome wasn't the good one of keeping my promise, but could have been something like breaking my promise. So there's really nothing to explain the difference between these two actions. So here, the tactic, I think, is to try to show, well, depends what you mean um, by explanation. So it seems to me there's a very straightforward way in trying to ex uh, explain why I kept my promise. I kept my promise because I believed it was the right thing to do. Um, that strikes me as a pretty good explanation. Now, it is true, had I broken my promise, I still would have retained that belief. But when we think of our ordinary interpersonal context, just think about asking a friend, hey, why do you go to such and such college? Um, they'll probably give you a reason. Hey, you know, it had this feature and that feature. It doesn't seem like we're assuming that given those features, they literally could not have done anything else. When we're trying to ask for explanations, we're just trying to ask for features that made the action the agents performed intelligible, reasonable, or understandable from their perspective. It doesn't seem like there's anything about indeterminism that rules that out. Now, this kind of explanation is ruled out. If, in if my decision is undetermined, there really was nothing prior to my decision 
that made it the case that I had to perform that. But why think our actions should be intelligible by those lights? Okay, so obviously more to be said on both of those. But again, the problem of luck comes in many different versions, and the strategy of the book is to distinguish those versions that seem worrisome but make false assumptions about libertarianism from those versions that make no false assumption about libertarianism but don't really isolate anything that would be worrisome in the first place. That was excellent, Chris. Thanks. Uh, we're pretty low on time, but I think it's worth asking one more question if you're all right with it. And it's about uh, the last part of your book where you talk about a worry for reductionism, for reducing agency to this kind of event causal framework. So could you tell us very quickly in a very short answer what you take this worry for reductionism to be and how it's related to libertarianism? Yeah. So remember on the event causal view, the contention is that for you to cause your action simply consists in desires, beliefs, reasons, emotions involving you causing that action. And it might strike you as follows. Wait a second. I'm not my desires. I'm not my beliefs. I'm not my loves. I'm not my cares. I'm not my emotions. I, I mean, I have these things. That is, I'm the subject of those things. But I'm not identical to them. And thus, if everything I do is wholly caused by these states and events, then nothing, strictly speaking, that I do is caused by me. Um, so I call this the it ain't me argument. And the worry is that on this event causal view, there's a kind of reductionism, right? We're reducing what the agent does to what states and events involving her do. But there's a worry here that on this account really in some sense leaves out the agent, that the agent isn't actually bringing about the action. since After all, she isn't identical with um uh, any of them. And so the way this works out in the book is I say at the beginning of the book, let's just assume agency reductionism works and see how far it can go. And I argue you can defend it against the problem of luck. You can defend it against the problem of enhanced control. And I think the real worry for event causal libertarianism is something like this, it ain't me argument. But the important thing here to realize is this isn't an argument that's tailored to libertarianism. This is an argument that raises worries also for compatibilists who espouse a kind of reductionist, uh, reductions, uh, reductionistic uh, framework of agency. So it seems to me the kind of real lurking problem behind event causal libertarianism, as it were, isn't the libertarianism. It's the event causal component. And that a, that a real, uh, or I should say a complete defense of event causal libertarianism will require us to take up this reductionist worry and think about what should we say? Should we say, actually, you are identical with your states and events? Or should we find a way of understanding how you can be the cause of your action, even though you aren't identical to them? And the way I leave it in the book is this is just simply a pressing problem that current, uh, I think, work doesn't yet give us direction on. Do you think there is a promising way out of this problem? While remaining a reductionist? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I I don't. I mean, so I suppose it's a um, when I first thought about this problem, I was in the early stages of writing my dissertation. And here's what I thought. I'll write my dissertation defending event causal libertarianism, and then I'll go solve that reductionist problem. Um, and I even, in fact, have a paper in which I offer a kind of reductionist model of event causal libertarianism. But as time went on, I became increasingly... Um, skeptical. In fact, I've become so skeptical that most of my recent papers have been trying to show all the kind of contenders for reductionism don't uh, succeed. Um, mm. So I'm not convinced reductionism doesn't work. After all, you know, it would be a pretty bad inference to say, well, none of the contenders today work, so there is no one that works. Um, but I have become increasingly skeptical um, about the likelihood of these uh, reductionist um, uh, accounts um, working. So I, as for my, for me, I'm as of now agnostic about this. If, if a reductionist account works, wonderful. But I'm also very interested now in thinking about some non-reductionist strategies as well, so that if the reductionist one doesn't work, um, we have a way of understanding on the non-reductionist line. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Chris. This has been excellent. Uh, where can interested listeners go to follow your work? Yeah, thanks, uh, Taylor. Matt, it's been great uh, chatting with you. 
Um, so as uh, Taylor mentioned, I've got a recent book published with Oxford University Press, Minimal Libertarianism. So particularly if you're interested in the view I've been talking about, you could go look at that. Also, you could um, Google me and you could find a website where I have a link um, to many of my papers on this and related kind of issues that you could follow up uh, if you're interested in. Awesome. Yeah, we'll be sure to put a link to your website in the show notes. Thanks again, Chris. In the next episode, we will be talking about agent causal libertarianism, and our guest will be Timothy O'Connor, who's the professor of philosophy at Indiana University. 